Good morning. Good morning. Don't worry, we're not going to do the whole event as a silent film. <laughs> we did have a little technical problem there. I'm very sorry. This, of course, is the year of the silent film, so uh, we're right in keeping with the trend. Nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience again. I'm Melinda Crane, and I'll have the honor to be your moderator during this morning's session. And if you were watching our movie, then you know from that very seamless slideshow that our topic this morning is transport for growth, developing connectivity. We focused in past years on how the economic crisis is affecting transport, and today we want to ask the question the other way around. What can transport do to get us back to growth? Most people in this room work in the transport sector, so you hardly need convincing that investing in transport and infrastructure is a good way to boost economies, whether in the long term or the short term. But you're also very well aware that transport is competing with many other sectors that make a similar claim, and that policymakers under pressure to balance budgets are weighing opportunity costs more carefully than ever as they decide how to channel scarce resources. So how much should fiscally constrained economies spend on public infrastructure, and what kinds of transport investments are most essential for growth? How can policymakers best harness the sector's potential to drive sustainable recovery and green growth? And above all, this morning, we want to focus on connectivity. It's what this session is all about in more ways than one. Our roster of speakers spans the globe from Latin America to Asia, North America, and Europe. But before we hear from them, just a few practical items. Not all of our panelists will be speaking English. You should have all found a headset on your seats, and I see plenty of others on empty seats. So if you do need a headset, then please get one now. Our discussion will be followed by the award ceremony in this room right afterwards. And after that, we will take our time-honored family photo. So if you're going to be in that, please do stay around. I promise you that the coffee break will last long enough that you will all get the refreshment that you need before the next sessions. As I mentioned, a recurring theme in this session and in the forum as a whole is connection both in that narrower sense of connectivity, the potential for harnessing new information technologies to make transport safer and more efficient, but also in the broader sense of breaking down institutional barriers, modal barriers, sectoral barriers that can hamper creative change. Our keynote speaker has devoted his career to promoting connection in this larger sense. Mr. Ancle Correa is Secretary General of the OECD, and under his leadership, the organization has expanded its membership and forged new links with a whole host of major economies. It's now an active participant in the G8 and the G20 summit processes, and it has become a hub for global dialogue. Mr. Gurria formerly served as Mexico's Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as its Minister for Finance and Public Credit. And for his manifold efforts to promote international interaction, he has received the first Globalist of the Year Award from Canada's International Council. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Ángel Guerrilla. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it's great to be in beautiful Leipzig for the 2012 edition of the International Transport Forum. It was also great that uh, this time around we could make it because in the past years we've had a uh, situation where the dates of the ITF were uh, overlapping the dates of the Ministerial Council meeting of the OECD itself. This time it was made a little earlier, so we'll be able to, to join you. International dialogue and cooperation is crucial, particularly in times of crisis. It is especially so in transport, the circulatory system of our economies. This forum is taking place in the context of prolonged uncertainty. According to the OECD's latest interim economic assessment, 
While we just moved away from the cliff's edge, the recovery remains deeply fragile. Growth is strengthening in North America and Japan, but in Europe, it is still weak. Unemployment remains high and growing in many countries, and the threat from sovereign debts persists in the Euro area. World trade growth remains muted, and emerging markets are also showing signs of a slowdown. Protectionism threatens, and inequality keeps rising. And by the way, when I say protectionism, it is not just the one we're used to, which is trade protectionism. There's also investment protectionism. There's also foreign exchange protectionism, all sorts of protectionism, and we should fight them all. Our countries need to do more to boost recovery and achieve long-term sustainable growth. With very little space left for fiscal and monetary policy, our main recommendations have been to go structural, go social, and go green. Going structural, of course, has to do with the fact that um, it's what is going to keep the medium and the long term going. Going social, we'll see that uh, it's because there's still millions and millions of victims of the crisis. And going green because we think it's the only way to go. We just published our green growth uh, initiative at the OECD, um, and uh, we're now rolling it out in different countries uh, individually. Now, recent OECD studies show how structural reforms and policies can deliver short-term economic and social benefits, while at the same time laying the foundations for long-term sustainable growth. One particular sector where structural reforms, innovation, and smart technologies can have a decisive impact on growth and employment is precisely the transport sector. Going seamless, the challenges of the transport sector. The transport sector needs rapid and radical transformation. Our transport outlook, uh, the transport outlook uh, 2012, uh, I'll be presenting it a little later today, uh, shows how the demand for transport is going to increase considerably in the coming years. By 2050, Global passenger transport volumes could be two to two and a half times as large as they are now, a figure that could rise up to three and a half times in non-OECD countries. Freight transfer figures could rise by a factor of three or more on the global level. Transport activities are already a big source of CO2 emissions. 23% come from combustion, and they are set to rise to 27% of total CO2 emissions by 2050. Now, our recent environmental outlook to 2050, we just put this one out, uh, and it's called the consequences of inaction, precisely, uh, because it, it, it says basically that on water, on bi uh, biodiversity, on climate change, on the quality of air, any known path of action is lower cost than the known and sometimes unknown costs of inaction. And that is a very, very loud and clear message that we should heed. And basically, the outlook suggests that without immediate action by 2050, we will see a 50% increase in greenhouse ga gas emissions with a disastrous impact on the living standards of people everywhere. These prospects highlight the key challenges for the transport sector. How can we meet growing demand when funds are scarce and transport systems are already under strain? How can we ensure mobility and provide the needed infrastructure to a growing and increasingly urbanized population without, furthering endanger, without further endangering our planet? How can we make sure that our decisions today will not lock in our infrastructure in a non-sustainable pattern? What we decide today is going to define the world in the next generation or two. And therefore, uh, it's not a medium and long-term issue. It's a today issue. The theme of our meeting today is timely. Adopting a seamless transport paradigm facilitates an integrated approach to dealing with these challenges. Seamlessness is about better connecting people 
connecting markets, connecting ideas. Seamlessness is about helping the flow of goods. Like, for example, the new uh, 12,000 freight rail route that links Germany with China. It is about better planning our cities so that land use patterns facilitate sustainable mobility. Seamless transport is also about equity by providing our communities better access to job opportunities through high quality multimodal connections and door to door services. For transport to promote long term sustainable growth, seamlessness is the way to go. The most critical contribution of seamless transport is through trade. It's an old fashioned formula, but it still works. Growth through trade. Global value chains underscore the importance of transport services for which we must promote openness. But we need to be able to measure openness and identify what works and what does not work in terms of regulations. I'm pleased that the recently launched OECD Service Trade Restrictiveness Index, Service Trade Resist Restrictiveness Index, this is a project which we're working on, will provide you with a need a needed tool to assess openness of transport services regimes. We're working together with the IDF here, although this is a broader uh, project at the OECD. We're working together with the WTO also and with all the members, but of course with the ITF and what refers to transport. Seamless supply chains would greatly benefit from removing obstacles at the borders. A 10% increase in global trade would be achieved if only we could improve customs and security procedures. 10% increase in global trade. Now, this is at a time when trade dropped, then it picked up very fast, and we thought it was gonna keep on, on a growth path, and then it kind of ebbed and is now moving rather undecidedly on. So just by increasing and improving the custom systems. Now, 10% in global trade is an additional $400 billion to global GDP. Therefore, the connection between trade and growth and seamless, seamlessness transport. Uh, there you have this, the seamless transport connection to greater growth. Borders can kill trade. There are, however, effective customs services in the world. In Australia, for instance, 99.98%, I suppose this percentage was used just to signify that it's not everything, but they couldn't find what was not there. So 99.98% um, of cargo is released within 15 minutes of lodging electronic import documents last year. Admirable. Now this is an example of excellence. Not everybody is there, but unfortunately it is quite the opposite of the slow, outdated, and frankly, unprofessional and non-transparent procedures that persist in some of our borders and many of our ports. We're actually now engaged at the OECD in doing an analysis of port cities and precisely looking at some of these issues uh, specifically. Quality infrastructure is another pillar for seamless supply chains. I know that our German hosts are vying with Singapore, Sweden, and the Netherlands for the title of the world's logistics champions. New figures on the performance of national logistics systems were presented here yesterday, and hopefully all our member countries will be competing to be top in that list. Now, thinking seamless can also help to foster growth in a more sustainable, greener way. Deep cuts to greenhouse gas emissions from transport will require reducing the carbon intensity of travel. This is partly a matter of changing the energy basis of transport away from oil, which implies increasing integration of transport and electricity systems. The IA estimates that rapid development of electric vehicles could shave around 12% off transport CO2 emissions by 2050. Although the biggest reductions will come from fuel economy improvements in conventional vehicles. 
Technology is also key to reducing emissions. But again, technology alone will not do the job. We need to convince users to adopt less energy intensive mobility habits. This means greening mobility, but it often also means better mobility. For example, using buses and trains more often where currently cars are the default choice. Japan, Switzerland, the Netherlands are admired as models of integration of transport modes, but there are many other successful examples all over the world, from Madrid's intermodal exchange stations to Frankfurt's airport rail dash air services some of it, that some of us uh, used to get here. Now, in a period of budgetary pressures and austerities, transport ministers need to think even more creatively how to invest in the future. And let me share a few thoughts. First, efforts to reform the regulatory environment in transport can make a vital difference. And that doesn't have a lot of cost, by the way. It's mostly a political cost to affect some of the vested interests, but it doesn't require public spending. We're seeing today the enormous opportunities from the introduction of direct competition on tracks for high-speed high train services in Italy. Already that is happening. We're seeing uh, as we speak here. Improving planning and coordination among levels of government and across line ministries is also crucial for providing more effectively connected and seamless transport modes and facilitate private sector participation. This morning, we had a breakfast with the private sector advisory board precisely to see how it was that we could facilitate the flows of financing and financing of, of course, next year's uh, um, main theme. Policy integration and coordination is a prerequisite for seamless transport and for putting transport on a green growth path. Second, thinking seamless helps make smart investment choices. And they also, those smart investment choices will have larger payoffs at a relatively modest cost. One example is the smart oyster card used on all of London's public transport. The smart card radically speeds up access and reduces crowding. It is now used for around 90% of the journeys uh, for the underground rail. And today, a new generation of contactless payment bank cards offers travelers the prospect of using a single card to access transport in any city in the country. Smartphones are also in the picture. Already used to pay for buses and metro rides in places like Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. They're also being used as uh, airport check-in services and others, and by the way, in some, in some cases, it has skipped the usual conventional uh, um, uh, technology and is now uh, more developed in countries like Kenya or India, maybe than in some of our OECD countries. Third, although successful implementation of smart cards and smartphone payment systems is very much a private sector role, governments have the essential responsibility of brokering to take the revenue sharing agreements between transport companies that make smart cards interoperable. That means you have to have a prior agreement on who's gonna get what from whom, and once you have that, you can make the system free. And then uh, the, the sharing is gonna be predetermined, but you can't do that after. You can only do that before. That is where the brokerage role of governments lies. Also, uh, they can also make their use a condition for awarding public uh, sector concessions. Remember, the public service has the power of the beginning. The, po the public services give the concessions and you can say, well, you know, no innovation, no concessions. Huh? Simple as that. And then you can compete for the price, you can compete for the quality of the service, but you can also compete for the innovative part of the project. Ladies and gentlemen, we, um, we just put out uh, this uh, strategic transport infrastructure needs to 2030, again, in close uh, cooperation with the ITF. Um, the, 
the numbers, the numbers are mind-boggling. Uh, you know, uh, here with Gus McDonald, we say it's, it's in the trillions, in the trillions. You lose track of the zeros. And, uh, uh, but uh, effectively, it is both necessary but also possible to raise this kind of money, uh, provided we uh, get our ducks in line. Thinking and acting seamless should be part of this new approach. More seamless transport is critical to driving growth, especially through trade, and helps identify smart investment opportunities for greener growth. Seamless transport can improve the everyday lives of our, all our citizens, determining their access to jobs and education. So making transport seamless is a part of our core business at the OECD, at the ITF, of making better transport policies for better lives. So have a wonderful, fruitful, and seamless forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Angel Guria, for those very thought-provoking and compelling words. Lots of inspiration there for our panel discussion as it gets underway. But while they're putting these chairs in place, perhaps I'll just try my hand at a brief summary. At a time of budgetary pressure, allocating scarce resources needs to occur with a view to broad societal goals. This is what I'm understanding the Secretary General to be saying, goals such as inclusiveness, sustainability. And I understand Mr. Gurria to be arguing that promoting seamlessness is a cost-effective way to reach those goals, because if it's done right, it focuses on the whole system, and it has the effect to significantly alter both coordination between stakeholders and customers' mobility decisions. Now, we've been hearing ever since 2008 that an economic crisis can also be an opportunity. I'm wondering, is this the opportunity for seamlessness? Could tighter funding constraints provide the impetus to rethink regulatory structures that hamper the emergence of seamless services? And could budgetary pressures encourage the adoption of innovative funding mechanisms, including efficiency, improving user charges, those are just a couple of the questions that we want to address now with our panel. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, the ITF has assembled a very impressive group of governmental and industry leaders. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce them without further delay. Doris Leutard is federal counselor in the government of Switzerland and heads the Federal Department of Environment, Transport, Energy, and Communications. She's a former president of the Swiss Confederation, and she was previously at the helm of the Federal Department of Economic Affairs with broad responsibility for economic and trade policy. Welcome. Leo Varadkar is Ireland's Minister for Transport, Tourism and Sport. He too is well-versed in broad economic issues for he previously held the Communications, Energy and Natural Resources portfolio. And he's also served as spokesperson on enterprise, trade and employment. A warm welcome, if you would please, for <laughs> Minister Varadkar. Zhongling Feng is Vice Minister and member of the leading group of the Chinese Communist Party Committee at the Ministry of Transport in China. He's a senior engineer and he has held leading positions in planning and highway transportation at the Ministry of Communications, serving as its Director General from 2000 to 2003. Welcome. And it's an honor to introduce Norman Baker. He's Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the United Kingdom's Department of Transport, a position he has held since his appointment in May 2010. A Liberal Democrat, he's also held a number of shadow cabinet positions, and he served as leader of Luz District Council. Welcome to you. Susan Kurland is Assistant Secretary for Aviation and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Transportation. She's responsible for economic and competition policy affecting the air transport industry and also oversees the department's international activities. Great that you can be with us.
Yoshiyuki Kazai is chairman and representative, and representative director of Central Japan Railway Company, which owns and operates the Tokaido Shinkansen bullet train system, and which is also developing the superconducting maglev system. Mr. Kazai has steered the railways of Japan through privatization. It's an honor that you're with us. And Dr. Rüdiger Grube is chairman of the management board and CEO of Deutsche Bahn and DB Mobility Logistics. He previously served on the managing board of Daimler, and he also headed the board of directors of the European Aeronautic Defense and Space Company. Willkommen. Before we get started, I'm going to make sure everybody has their headphones in place because we're going to start out with a non-English contribution. So let's just uh, all get ready with our equipment here. And I'd like to begin by testing the scope of Mr. Guria's recommendations. Vice Minister Fong, we just heard a very compelling case for smart transport investment and investment in seamlessness and what that can do to stimulate growth in advanced economies facing deep crisis. But that, of course, is not entirely the situation in your country. So the question is, do his arguments, do his recommendations also hold true for China, even though it is still happily facing robust growth and investment? First of all, I would like to say I have the honor to uh, attend this panel. I'd like to share with you here some of the experience we gained during the development of transport industry for social economic growth. I'd like to talk about three points. First, I'll give you some general information of China's integrated transport. Since the adoption uh, of the reform and opening up policies in late 1970s, China has obtained tremendous, tremendous in building the integrated transport system. Uh, a well-balanced and connected transport system was formulated and strongly supported the rapid and sustainable social economic economic development. The uh, total length of uh, network uh, transport uh, uh, developed very fast. L the end of last year, uh, 85,000 uh, 85, uh, kilometers of uh, expressway and the total length of network of world uh, road is 4 million point 1 kilometers and China has uh, lots of uh, uh, networks for different uh, transport me means uh, completed um, and um, uh, now we are in the period of uh, structural optimization network connection and operation integration and we are now highlighted the uh, improvement of uh, uh, services and uh, recent years we have lots of problem with relating to safety environment and uh, uh, energy consumption uh, to solve the uh, uh, problem relating to automobile uh, society and also we are trying to reduce uh, urban congestions and uh, also uh, in cities and also to uh, to increase the uh, uh, transport services in rural areas. Now we have regular uh, uh, bus services in countries, counties and the villages. Uh, more than 98.12% and 91.47% of uh, counties and villages have uh, such services. Uh, we 
do uh, realize that in the process, this is my second point uh, to share with you the significance of uh, integrated transport uh, for social economic development. Just now you mentioned about the uh, tackling of uh, international finances, uh, uh, how we tackle the uh, this financial crisis by constructing our infrastructure system in 1998, as well as the recent uh, transport uh, financial crisis in the world. Um, we have such uh, policies on upgrading our uh, uh, infrastructure system. Last year, we completed more than 10,000 kilometers of expressway construction, and these kinds of uh, uh, construct construction of uh, development uh, has uh, uh, supported China's uh, ec export-oriented uh, economies, promoted our adjustment and optimization of uh, industrial layouts, provided uh, the uh, convenient uh, most uh, means for uh, people's mobility and also provide good conditions uh, for the seamless transport of goods, reduce time and costs. Lastly, I'd like to say something about the uh, development strategies on China's integrated transport system. Uh, 2011 to 2015 is the 12th five-year plan period of China, and also an opportunity for us to, uh, to develop the transport sector we have the following uh, strategies for the seamless uh, transport system uh, so as to have balanced uh, 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 strategies for various means. Uh, first, to continue to improve integrated uh, planning for transport uh, to coordinate the the integration of planning for various transport modes and also to promote the effective connections of different modes to speed up the structure of uh, modern transport hubs. The third is to enforce the studies and formulation of transport policy standards and specifications. The fourth is to uh, speed up the construction of public tr information services uh, platform so as to improve the administration of integrated transport. Thank you. Vice Minister Fang, well, that's quite an ambitious set of goals. For contrast, let's go now to a country that is very much facing the sort of budgetary pressures that Secretary General Gurria mentioned. Minister Vardka, you have warned that Ireland will be doing very little in the way of major new road or rail projects. You've said it may be disappointing to people, but that you're going to be concentrating on maintaining what's already there. That sounds as if you're saying that there may not even be room for the kind of investments that we heard Mr. Guria advocating. You should have a hand, Michael, and here it is. I, I have one here. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the question, and it's a pleasure to be here in Leipzig. Um, this is my first time here as a newly appointed minister from uh, a new government, um, and I think you've set the scene very well. In Ireland, we've had uh, a major financial and budgetary crisis that you'll all know about. We've lost roughly 20% of our GDP. Uh, unemployment has gone from maybe 3% to 14%. And while we ran very big budget surpluses in the past, uh, we now have a big deficit. And that really has made uh, transport investment uh, very difficult. Um, the broader economic situation is now stabilizing. Uh, in the sense that employment is now increasing again. We had some growth in the economy last year, um, and the deficit is now actually falling, uh, unlike in most countries. But um, we have huge debts as well, uh, largely because of the cost of running the deficits in recent years, uh, but also the cost of recapitalizing our banking system, uh, which was as much done to protect the European banking system as it was to protect our own. And that's, that's an ongoing difficulty for us. Um, so what we had during our boom period between 2001 and 2008 uh, was huge investment in transport. There was a whole new motorway network which has transformed the country, uh, new airport terminals, we reopened some closed railways, uh, and most of that investment was worth doing. Um, but a lot of it actually wasn't. 
uh, and at the time we were subscribers as a country to this view that, um, I'm not sure if you've seen the Kevin Costner film, Field of Dreams, uh, where he builds this baseball pitch and uh, the theory there is if you build it, they will come. And we found with a lot of our transport network, uh, well, they didn't come. And we now have um, railways that run at a massive loss and half empty airport terminals. So I think what we're going to be from now on is a lot more smarter and a lot more considerate about our investment. Uh, so the first thing absolutely is to maintain what we have. Um, but secondly, is exactly that sort of seamless and smart investment in transport. So while we're only building a few new roads and linking up a few railways, what we're doing a lot of is that low cost, very smart, but very efficient investment. Uh, so we've brought in an Oyster card in Dublin, for example, our Leap card. Uh, we're putting Wi-Fi in on all the buses and trains so that ex improves people's experience uh, of public transport. Um, we have intelligent information systems now in our motorways, so there's a lot of signs telling people what's happening with the traffic and what's ahead. Um, on a lot of our bus stops, there's little signs telling you when the buses are coming. Uh, on your phone, there's an app, and the app can tell you then as well where the bus is, when it's coming. You can even send a text um, based on the number on the bus stop to tell you uh, how far away the bus is. Uh, we're putting a lot into cycle networks as well, which can be very efficient, uh, and then a lot in the last mile. So say, for example, um, we're investing in the train stations at a relatively low cost, but putting into the train stations uh, hubs so that the bus can actually come into the train station and drop people off, uh, putting in cycleways and cycle parking so that more people uh, can cycle to the train station. Um, and what we're trying to do, particularly in rural areas, is to create transport hubs. Um, so you bring together the bus station, the train station, things that seem logical but often aren't the case. Uh, and then finally, we're doing some regulatory reforms. Uh, we're opening up our railways to competition for people who may wish to, to, um, to provide service in our railways. And we're exploring the idea of going down the route that other cities have gone down, particularly in our major cities, uh, of franchising out the bus services. So really what we're trying to do is to maintain what we have, first of all. Uh, secondly, uh, improve what we have and do those low cost improvements that uh, bring about seamlessness and improve the passenger's experience of transport, public transport in particular. Uh, and then and only then are we doing major new projects and that of course is very limited by, uh, by the financial situation. Minister Vodka, thank you very much. Ever since the crisis began, there's been concern, of course, that hard-pressed governments would cut back on promoting long-term sustainability in order to promote short-term stimulus. I'd like to go now to you, Federal Councillor Leuthardt, because Switzerland, of course, has been a champion of transport policy that sees integration or seamlessness as a key way to go green. But it is a very long-term proposition. And the question is, can you maintain the reliable investment stream that's needed to make that happen in a time of economic crisis. Yes, good morning, everybody. I think we must. Uh, Switzerland is uh, regularly uh, ranked one or two on competitiveness. And one element besides of R&D investments, flexible labor market, is the quality of infrastructure. And therefore, uh, we, uh, since many years, we, f uh, we found uh, that a steady investment is necessary for to be competitive and to be attractive for investors. Uh, for the moment, we dig another tunnel, the longest railway tunnel of the world, to connect uh, Europe uh, from Rotterdam to Genoa. This is one of the main corridors of the European infrastructure. To do this, we have a special funding system. Because for infrastructure, I think the very difficult si si uh, situation is when you have annual uh, budget cuts, when you have annual decisions. Uh, we are planning, but we are not realizing it. We have cuts from parliaments. And in infrastructure, you need a long time planning and realizing. So therefore, we have a fund which is independent from uh, the state budget. This fund, uh, uh, we can use it for all these big projects 
and uh, the resources we use for that is heavy vehicle fee, mineral oil tax uh, and other uh, 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 resources. And this allows us to be every year in line with the project to realize that and to be independent also from macroeconomic uh, uh, effects. And uh, this allows us really to, to maintain the uh, investments made in roads, made in our railway system. Road to rail, of course, is an absolute pillar of the Swiss approach. So uh, logically speaking, we should go next to Deutsche Bahn CEO, Rüdiger Grube. You have long sung the virtues of intermodality, Dr. Grube. Um, you don't need much convincing, I guess, about seamlessness, but tell us, if you would, please, how you believe it can best be facilitated. Yeah, at first, I would like to say thank you so much for the possibility to join you tomorrow, to, today here on the stage. Uh, I would like to say that seamless transport is the most decisive success factor to being uh, successful in our business, which i not mentioning a rail business, I'm really here for mobility and logistics. Why I'm saying this? As you mentioned in my introduction, uh, I was working for the automotive industry, I was working for the aircraft industry, now I'm also in the rail business. But for me, the last century was a century of automobile. The next century will be the century of smart intermodal network. And how crisis, for example, can accelerate this direction, I would like to give you a good example. In the past, we delivered all components for a big automotive company here in Germany to China per ocean freight. And we needed 46 days from Leipzig, here from this nice city, to Zhenyang. Today, we are doing this by train and we are using only 21 days. And what is the big advantage? Because we have seamless transport and we have reduced the capital cost by 50%. Because half of the time means 50% of capital cost. And this is a big advantage. So this is a good example how a crisis can accelerate seamless transport. Another issue, I was responsible for a big automotive company, you mentioned Daimler. I was also responsible for logistics. Frankly speaking, I was never asking for a logistic company who is able to uh, deliver 100,000 units per car from Sindelfing, southwestern part of Germany, to Bremerhaven, where the big harbor is. No, I was asking for a supplier who is able to deliver 100,000 units from Sindelfing to Tuscaloosa in the US. I needed the train, I needed the chip, and I needed the trucks. So, and everything out of one hand, that is seamless transport making connections. Thank you very much. Mr. Gruber mentioned, among other things, the challenges of trying to cut costs and simultaneously meet rising demand. Yoshiyuki Kazai, the Tokaido corridor links one of the most densely populated urban agglomerations in the world, and even in a time of economic crisis, population growth there, of course, continues. Is seamlessness a way to manage those kind of challenges? Yes, thank you. This uh, Tokaido Shinkansei uh, is actually a high-speed railway network, and uh, um, my company is operating this Tokaido Shinkansen, and the uh, overall region connecting Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka only covers about 20% of the total size of Japan, but uh, it also covers 70 million uh, in population, accounting for 60% of the total uh, the population of Japan, and it produces 60% of uh, total uh, Japanese GNP. So uh, there's a high density economic activity area. So uh, the uh, passenger uh, the, uh, transport uh, is mainly handled by Tokaido or Shinkansen. But it does not mean that uh, it uh, uh, can uh, handle all the transport needs. Uh, Tokyo, Yokohama, Nagoya, 
uh, Osaka. Uh, in, uh, those internal links uh, is uh, connected by uh, urban railway networks or private railway networks or subway networks. So there's a variety of uh, transport options or modes available. So uh, it uh, provides a very efficient uh, this, uh, way of uh, transport operation. And uh, since the uh, foundation of uh, uh, Tokaido Shin Shinkansen, but the uh, uh, population increase uh, recorded about 50% uh, since it, uh, the beginning of its operation. And the uh, transport capability uh, needs to be uh, maximized. Uh, that is the uh, target when we uh, try to combine various uh, transport modes. So uh, Tokaido Shinkansen runs about uh, 340 uh, trains per day. And uh, uh, all uh, trains uh, consist of uh, 16 uh, cars and the uh, same type of cars and the specifications as well as accommodations are standardized. So any organization of cars uh, can be done using any kind of cars uh, available. Uh, in other words, uh, this is the same way applied by LCC in the aviation industry. And uh, uh, this is the transport uh, most, uh, what I mean is Tokaido Shinkansen, is uh, an, a very easy to understand uh, transport mode, uh, providing a density of uh, transport service. Uh, if you want to move from one point to another in this area, uh, you don't have to change your own schedule according to a train timetable, because once you go to a train, uh, go to a station, then you find a train is already coming within five minutes. And if you have uh, there's more time than five minutes, then uh, there is uh, uh, Express IC system uh, which enables people to change reservation anytime. Uh, by doing so, uh, Tokaido Shinkansen is carrying 400,000 people per day. And when we look at uh, uh, intercity uh, transport, uh, there's also integrated transport uh, network. Uh, there's also a discussion uh, on uh, propagating uh, or advocating the uh, mixed operation of uh, the uh, various uh, train lines. But uh, if we do so, it would undermine the benefits uh, of uh, uh, the uh, train uh, networks. It is important to make the best use of the advantages of each system in order to ensure the uh, efficiency of uh, transport system. That is very important in my view. The most important preposition uh, of uh, efficiency is, needless to say, safety. Safety has to be kept by all means. And also, operational punctuality and accuracy is uh, very important. If there is any delay, then uh, that will harm the uh, uh, mobility of people or uh, at the time of uh, natural disaster, including typhoon or earthquake, if we cannot ensure the uh, safety operation of trains, uh, that would hinder the uh, formation of network. So uh, safety, accuracy, and the punctuality. On top of that, uh, the technology development uh, has to be uh, continued. Uh, it was 25 years ago uh, since uh, this uh, company was privatized, and uh, uh, it's already 50 years since the operation of Shinkansen. And in the meantime, the uh, uh, maximum uh, speed uh, increased from 220 to 270. And uh, uh, there's one more station added uh, in the vicinity of Tokyo Station uh, to enhance efficiency. So by combining all sorts of methodology and uh, by developing a new technology, uh, we are always making efforts to uh, improve the total system. So uh, facility and technology and human, uh, those are the three uh, essential factors. When we look at the future, uh, 
Uh, at the moment, it takes about uh, this, uh, two and a half years to connect uh, Tokyo and uh, Osaka. Uh, it used to take about uh, six hours, but now uh, we have completed the technology which enables us to uh, connect these two cities within uh, one hour. We have already uh, started uh, the con uh, construction covering 43 uh, kilometers, and the full-scale construction will start uh, in 2014. So better service and uh, safety uh, will be always uh, taken into consideration. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Assistant Secretary Kurland, high-speed rail, of course, a matter of some controversy in the US with its ongoing discussion of the merits of infrastructure uh, investment <coughs> during the economic crisis. What's your view? What are the best kinds of transport investments for promoting growth? Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to key up you need a microphone. I will speak that loudly. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, key off on a couple of the remarks made by some of the previous speakers, including um, our keynote speaker. And that has to do with how do we promote seamless intermodal transportation and then how do we pay for it? And historically, um, in the United States, many of our programs, or most of our programs, have been focused on a specific type of transportation project with their own um, stream of funding. And so what I'd like to talk a little bit about this morning is uh, a couple of the initiatives that um, we have undertaken or we're in the process of undertaking that would provide uh, more intermodal planning, more intermodal uh, financing and um, thoughts for various uh, projects. And President Obama uh, and Secretary LaHood, uh, Secretary of Transportation, and, and let me just stay, I bring you uh, his regards and his greetings and his regrets that he could not be here himself um, uh, this morning. But, you know, we are taking a broader view on what is the best way to plan intermodally how do we create sustainable communities? Where, how do we get our people, our, 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 our people to uh, work? How do we get our goods to market? And what are the best and most efficient ways to be thinking about that? And um, in terms of funding and planning, uh, Congress had passed what we're calling the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARA. And in that act, they authorized a competitive grant program called the TIGER program, which stands for Transportation Investments Generating Economic Recovery. And when we make these grants, and we've uh, made several in the past uh, few years, our goal is to provide incentives for achieving greater efficiencies in the transportation system through a national competition that rewards innovative and multimodal and multi-jurisdictional transportation projects that promise significant economic and environmental benefits you know, for an entire metropolitan region, uh, for an area, or even for the nation as a whole. And we've seen that more than 40% of these TIGER grants have gone to support projects that will speed delivery of products from our factories, our farms, and businesses across the U.S. and around the world. And we're, you know, we focus again on multimodal transit, whether it's, um, freight rail, highways, seaports, and airports. So we're placing a priority on the kinds of projects that can, and de can, that can deliver uh, these benefits. In the President's uh, 2013 budget proposal, we have a proposal that would create a national infrastructure bank. And what this would allow us to do would be to leverage private investment to finance transportation projects that are regional or national in scope. And we also have a proposal in the President's budget for what we're calling Transportation Leadership Awards. And this would be a competition um, sort of in a, a, that would provide $20 billion for a race to the top style of incentive uh, program. Um, so these are a couple of the programs. The TIGER program is in effect the um, uh, National Infrastructure Bank and this uh, Transportation Leadership Awards are part of the President's proposed budget. Uh, we're also focusing a great deal on intelligent transportation systems. We've done a great deal of work in that. Our, um, uh, in our, rec our research and technology uh, mode of, uh, modal administration has an office specifically dedicated to that. 
In terms of high-speed rail, um, where you started your question, um, the, the President, the Secretary are deeply committed to this project and our goal is to provide 80% of uh, Americans access to high-speed rail within 25 years. We have a lot to learn from many of our colleagues sitting um, on the dais with us. Uh, we have a lot that we can, uh, we can also teach in terms of freight, um, uh, but this is an area where uh, we are very, very focused. One final area that I would be very remiss in not mentioning would be um, next generation technology in the aviation sector. Uh, again, this is a, a major, major commitment of the department from, and also with our uh, Federal Aviation um, Administration in order to modernize our air traffic control system. This is an ongoing rolling program where we are transitioning from uh, radar to uh, satellite-based um, system. And what this will do it will be increase efficiency, it will reduce delays, and it will also improve safety and, uh, and reduce adverse impact, um, environmental impacts. So with that, I've taken you, th given you a little bit of a, uh, a ride through the U.S., and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. And we'll ride back over the Atlantic now to Great Britain. Uh, we heard from Minister Vardkar earlier on uh, that countries under fiscal pressure basically need to be content with good enough infrastructure rather than field of dreams. But if I listen to what Prime Minister Cameron is saying under Secretary Baker, I have to conclude that Britain is somewhat more ambitious, in part because apparently you're hoping to leverage a lot more private funding. Indeed, thank you very much. Well, no two countries are the same, and we all have our individual circumstances, of course, but uh, we have our economic difficulties as much as anybody else does in the, in the, in the international uh, financial problems that uh, are apparent to us all in this room. But we've taken the view that uh, when you're in some difficult economic difficulty, the question is not can you afford to invest in transport, the question is can you afford not to invest in transport. Because we see that uh, capital infrastructure projects are a way both of creating short-term jobs, but also a way of in ensuring that the economies are in a better position uh, in the medium term. And therefore, although we've made uh, reductions in expenditure uh, across government, we've protected capital investment, particularly in transport. Um, there is no question that uh, um, there is a close link between the performance of the economy and the capability and efficiency of the transport system. Those two go hand in hand. Um, and therefore, we've tried to look at this in uh, three ways, I think. One is to look at uh, where there is congestion, where there are pinch points, where there are restrictions which are causing delays and inefficiencies in the system, whether it's in the railway network or in the road system. Uh, we've secondly looked at what we might do on the environment, we'll come back to in a moment. And thirdly, uh, we want to get efficiencies in the way that my, my colleague from, from the Republic of Ireland talked about in terms of making sure that we uh, do the small scale improvements which can make a significant difference, which don't cost very much money, but can make, make a big difference to people's lives through the introduction of uh, smart car technology and through the introduction of better connectivity, for example, between rail and air or between rail and bus. Um, so in terms of the uh, big projects, we are proceeding now with uh, our uh, second high-speed rail line um, to take north from London that will connect with HS1, which means in due course people should be able to get a train from, from Scotland through to Germany uh, or, or uh, further afield for that matter. Uh, we've got uh, on the railway network the biggest investment program now since the 19th century. Um, and that is because uh, rail travel is both greener than, than uh, road travel at the moment, but also because there's a tremendous demand in the UK for rail travel. So we've actually got more people now travelling by rail than at any time since 1929, uh, with a network which is probably half the size it was in 1929 because of closures that shouldn't have taken place, frankly, in the 1960s and 19. 70s. So it's about improving capacity. It's about actually reopening some of the railway lines that shouldn't have been closed, redoubling lines that shouldn't have been singled. Uh, it's about providing new stations where it's sensible to do so. We're also engaged in a massive program of electrification uh, where we're going to electrify almost a thousand lines, a thousand miles of lines in the, in the near future compared to actually just nine miles of lines under the previous uh, governments in the last 13 years. We're building thousands of new railway carriages. Uh, on the road network, we're engaged in, in uh, improving and providing extra infrastructure where necessary there as well, uh, using the hard shoulders of motorways, providing new connections where it's necessary to do so. And 
the second theme uh, which I mentioned there was the environmental theme. Uh, the purpose of the Department for Transport in the UK, as far as we're concerned, is first of all to aid economic growth and secondly to help meet our carbon reduction targets, which we take very seriously indeed. If we're going to meet our reduction targets, so we heard the useful introduction from OECD at the beginning here, we very much share that agenda, then we have to deal with transport. Um, and we have to deal with road transport in particular. So in order to do that, we are investing hundreds of millions of pounds, both in, in encouraging uh, the rollout and providing the rollout of uh, charge points for electric vehicles, uh, providing reductions for those who wish to purchase cars and vans to bring the cost of those electric vehicles down to a, a level which compares with a, no, a traditional car or a van. Uh, we're also investing heavily in research and development for those uh, electric vehicles. And, and our vision is to get um, uh, a transport system which is much lower in terms of carbon input and, uh, and output. And actually, that's also good for the economy because we think this, we want to be ahead of the game. We want to be ahead and we want to attract the investment which is going to be necessary for the environment in the longer term. So, for example, we're very pleased that Nissan's coming to open, uh, well, produce its, leaf fact, uh, produce its new leaf in, in uh, Sunderland in the northeast. We've got a battery plant which is starting there. Uh, and we want to be the place which says uh, we're encouraging this forward investment in the environment, which is good for the economy and good for the environment. And in addition to that, there are a range of... of, of uh, uh, of schemes which I mentioned of a, of, a, of, a, of a less intensive nature in financial terms, but equally important in ensuring the connectivity Dr. Gruber and others have talked about uh, this morning. Now, some of that can come from traditional funding from central government, and we're investing, in fact, £30 billion pounds, uh, uh, over this four-year period in the government uh, in infrastructure improvement. But we also want to go further than that by identifying how we can identify funds from the private sector. Um, now, part of that is about ensuring that we get a uh, tie-in between ourselves and our pension funds. Now, the UK pension funds are rather isolated and atomized. They're not as, uh, as coherent as they are in, say, Australia or in Canada. And we've actually got investment from the Canadian pension funds uh, in, for example, Birmingham Airport. But in order to try to make the best use of UK pension funds, uh, we've brought together the UK pension funds. The Treasury has done so and we've created a memorandum of understanding between the UK uh, government and the UK pension funds to ensure that each individual pension fund doesn't have to go through the process of, uh, of checking each particular investment, but there's a platform there which can apply and, and, and all, that, all pension funds can access that platform, get the security they want for their investments they make in conjunction with the Treasury uh, in the UK. And we want to unlock those funds to try to make sure that we don't use traditional public funds alone, but and, uh, use those public, uh, private funds as well. We're also taking steps to make it uh, easier for councils, our local authorities, to invest in transport and giving them financial incentives to do so. In other words, we want to pull all the levers we can, public and private, to get the maximum investment we can in transport, which I think is good for the environment uh, and good for the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's stay with that funding issue for a moment because, of course, part of seamlessness is integration and coordination between stakeholders, including the private sector. Now, we do have in the audience today Lord Gus MacDonald. He's senior advisor to Macquarie Infrastructure, also a former UK transport minister. And Lord MacDonald, Macquarie pioneered pension fund investment in the transport sector. What's the recipe for success? And when you hear uh, Under Secretary Baker, is there enough there that it's really going to generate new private sector interest? Well, I, I think, Melissa, that um, to start from the beginning, you, you start, I think, where the, um, the Secretary General was earlier when he talked about uh, this report on uh, the uh, strategic transport infrastructure needs. And when you see the strong transport growth that's required, and the scale of that growth demands huge investment. Now, where do you get investment on that scale? The OECD says in the report that um, you know, the, the public sector funds are drying up, and it's essential, therefore, that the private uh, sector must uh, come in and help fund this ambition. And it actually identifies as the most attractive for uh, private sector partners the pension funds, partly because of their long-term investment horizons, but mainly because of their pension fund assets in the OECD countries, this is reckoned to total almost 20 trillion US dollars. So 
speaking as an advisor to Macquarie, we've been active uh, for over a decade now in putting together specialist infrastructure funds. And as uh, Norman Baker has said, the Canadians, the Dutch, and the Australians and others have been very enthusiastic there. But despite that decade of increasing activity, when you look at it closely, there's probably less than 1% of that $20 trillion pension pot currently being invested in infrastructure assets of any kind, uh, let alone in transport. So it's quite an urgent uh, area to try and open up. We've heard from the, the British minister, but I wonder if the panel could tell us what their governments uh, are doing or should be doing to promote more private sector investment in infrastructure. Thank you uh, for that question to the panel, uh, Dr. Gruber. And I'm going to ask everybody because I've still got lots of points I'd like to pick up on. If you could keep your answers brief, then we'll have time for even more contributions. I'm totally supporting your idea, but I think in order to find private investors, we have to clarify the requirements. For example, maybe this is a special German issue, but as long as for new infrastructure projects, there are not enough support from the politicians and from the public, from society, I tell you there will be never a private investor, first one. So we have to create a new awareness that infrastructure is a decisive prerequisite to have really a seamless transport systems. Secondly, funding, you are totally right, but an investor is only willing to invest if he is able to get his money which he has invested back. So at least it must be possible that you are earning your capital cost. And if I'm following the discussion which we have in Europe, in the European Commission, I tell you, at least in Germany, there will be never a private investor. So this is not, I'm not against regulatory issues. I'm really in favor. Re regulations are very important, but it must be reasonable and we should not kill the entrepreneurial spirit because the entrepreneurial spirit is a prerequisite in order to be successful. Doris Leuthard, I saw you nodding your head vigorously. Yes, well, I, uh, I think pension funds could be a good idea for, for countries which really are, are uh, scarce of resources. But I, I agree totally with uh, what Mr. Gruber said. An investor wants to have a return. So this means for the consumer, for the client, prices will increase. May it be on, on the road, may it be on railways, because, well, it's clear. And then government have a fund. Well, he's, this is total other story. We don't need an interest on our investment. We need uh, uh, to be cost effective, uh, but we don't need to make money out of that. And so therefore, whenever you have a possibility, I would to every government recommend uh, 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 try to do a financing by public financing, by your resources and not by the private sector. But in pension funds, it may be a little bit uh, different because, well, here also uh, there's another interest because you have also a long-term thinking and this may be uh, a, a quite good, good idea. For a lot of countries which have to invest, uh, think of Africa, Southeast Asia, a lot of developing countries, uh, PPP, uh, are, are, are nice to hear, but to realize it's not uh, realistic because uh, people can't afford to buy tickets for these railway systems and they don't can pay tolls every 10 kilometers. And therefore, I think for industrialized rich countries, yes, but uh, for most of the parts of the world, this uh, uh, funding probably does not help. I'm glad you mentioned that word tolls. Let's move away now a bit from the pension funds. Minister Vavka, I asked the question at the outset, could tighter funding constraints become an incentive to adopt innovative new funding mechanisms, including user-based charges, efficiency-based charges, and also beneficiary-based funding systems? How do you see it? Well, I, I suppose they could do, but a lot of it is down to public support and whether people are willing to pay uh, higher tolls or whether they're willing to pay higher charges. And uh, we built a lot of our motorways by PPPs and they have tolls and they have tolling systems. 
um, and people are willing to pay them, but they also bypass them, particularly heavy goods vehicles uh, are in large numbers using the old road network and still rattling through the towns uh, in order to avoid paying tolls. And also as part of the agreements that we had to make with the private contractors, in some cases there are traffic guarantees and where the traffic going through the toll hasn't met expectations, the government is then on the hook uh, to make up the difference. And that's something that we're very sore about, but unfortunately uh, we're stuck with. But on the issue of private financing, um, there really are two aspects to this. Uh, certainly for program countries, for countries that are in an IMF um, or EU funded program, it isn't just public finance that's dried up, it's private finance as well. Um, and I suspect there'll be a lot more countries entering programs in the next year or two, so it's probably something that people should be, should be aware of. And that's um, a great difficulty for us. Uh, so whereas we had a lot of PPPs, um, that's no longer the case. We tried to get the EIB on board, we tried to get banks on board. When we do get them on board, which is very difficult, uh, then, the, then the transport contractors back out. So we have a few road PPPs ready to go. Certainly if Macquarie has funds they want to invest, I have plenty of uh, PPPs ready to go, but it's been very hard to get investment for them. Uh, and they are also very costly. Uh, even if Ireland was to go back to the markets tomorrow, we could probably borrow at about six, six and a half percent. Hopefully if things go well, we'll be able to borrow at maybe three or four percent in two or three years time. Um, the return that private investors expect is usually much higher than that. Uh, so it's not always the case that private investment is good value for the taxpayer. It allows governments to think short term and get investments done quickly, uh, but the long term costs can actually be very high. Thank you very much. Vice Minister Fong, this discussion of course is very much based on concern about potential underinvestment. Um, some people look at China and think they see a risk of the opposite of overinvestment. To what degree is that a concern in your country, building too much, too fast, that field of dreams metaphor we heard before, and perhaps also building too short term without an eye to long term green considerations? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Do, for a country, so in uh, whether it is uh, over invested uh, in transport infrastructure, we should look at the general requirements of the national economic development. Uh, from China's experience, uh, we've gained a successful stories uh, in the past two international financial crises because through the large scale infrastructure development, we not only adjust our industrial uh, de uh, layouts and also so uh, the development, uh, the, the exploration of resources, and also it has great significance to the uh, changes of people's life. Uh, now, why China has become the number two largest economies in the world, it uh, heavily depends on uh, what we've done in the investment in our transport infrastructure development. But of course, in the for the future development, we are also taking care of the uh, safe and uh, secure as well as uh, sustainable uh, development. Uh, uh, but uh, now we still think we don't have enough uh, uh, transport infrastructures, especially in rural areas, and we still need the lots of uh, uh, area. Uh, we still need lots of infrastructure to support the quick development of economies for investment. I think just now we talk about a lot of about uh, on it. In China, it's also a problem for us uh, how to secure the good speed of uh, our economic development. We should also to find a better financial way in our development. We uh, found. Uh, uh, in China, for the development of uh, expressway, we used a tolling uh, system, and uh, uh, the inter uh, the central government uh, will uh, invest uh, uh, a lot uh, uh, with uh, some special purchase. Uh, uh, the tax uh, 
uh, and the local government should also have some investment uh, through their fiscal uh, uh, budget. And uh, also we encourage uh, the uh, communities to invest and also we welcome the uh, foreign investors to invest in our uh, infrastructure development and the implementation of the uh, construction of development, uh, we uh, secured the investment. Uh, last year, we invested more than 20 uh, million US dollars in transport, but uh, by doing this, we increased uh, the uh, uh, GDP devel uh, increase in general. Uh, we also think about a lot uh, how in the future we could encourage the, uh, 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 the private uh, investment and we agree with the previous colleagues that uh, private uh, investors should get returns but uh, uh, we should in the in the coming years, we will also adjust some policies in uh, relating to this uh, for the uh, public invested uh, motorways. Uh, we won't purchase too much. Uh, we won't purchase returns or profits. But for private invested uh, investment, we should use concession uh, contracts, but uh, within the concession period, uh, we should uh, evaluate uh, their uh, profit uh, to make it uh, rational. And then we should, uh, on the basis of that, we will pricing, uh, we will give a rational pricing uh, of the uh, toll roads. And uh, by uh, very careful calculation of the profit and investment, we will uh, fix uh, uh, net, n non, uh, a profitable uh, uh, road for the investors. And uh, after the concession period, uh, this will be returned to the government and it will be a non-profitable uh, road again. So that in general, that means uh, for public uh, invested uh, roads, no profits, but for private invested roads, it should be uh, a rational, uh, there should be a rational uh, uh, profits. So that's why we say in China, this is uh, still a rational period of tolling system and investment. Thank you. I mentioned before policy integration as one form of seamlessness and of course that means also integrating transport policy with environmental and climate policy assistant secretary curland and yet president obama has been rolling back some of his earlier uh, professed climate and green goals is that a necessary trade-off during the crisis between growth and green as not always being entirely compatible well first let me say a uh, microphone First, let me say that uh, President Obama is very supportive and very committed to um, uh, the environmental um, and environmental uh, agenda. You know, we have very strong uh, CAFE standards uh, that rec that were put in place during his administration, and we have more which are being uh, rolled out in terms of fuel economy standards for uh, cars and for um, uh, for trucks. Uh, we have some that are going into effect uh, that e make it stronger in 2016, and we have more that will be going into effect um, after that. So he's, he's extremely committed to the environmental uh, agenda. Uh, number two, in the Department of Transportation, one of the things that we are doing in terms of looking at sustainable development, how we work to create, um, you know, transit, other forms of transportation that make our, you know, make it, that help people work, live in the communities in which they work. How do we get them to their jobs? How do we get them to um, recreation? We're, you know, investing in uh, bike paths. We're investing in transit. We're investing. We talked about before, uh, high-speed rail. Um, so there is a very strong uh, commitment to the uh, to this agenda. In terms of the uh, public-private partnerships that were discussed before, as I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, in the president's budget, we have um, uh, the proposal for a national infrastructure bank. In the airport world, we have uh, currently in existence a, a pilot program for airport uh, privatization. Uh, 
that gives airports, uh, if they if they so wish, uh, they can um, apply to uh, privatize. Again, it, it, we we haven't seen that. Uh, be that successful yet, but it is out there, it is, it is available. Again, in the United States, um, we provide funding at the federal level in terms of grants to our local communities, but then the projects get implemented at the local community, and we've seen the local community, state, and local government levels, and we've seen that um, states and communities are looking at uh, more of the PP3 type projects in terms of tollways and, and the like. So we continue to look at a variety of different ways to make things work. Dr. Gruber, you had a comment. Yeah, I apologize that I'm a little bit direct, but I think to be committed is by far not enough. What we need is execution. If I see the CO2 emission issues, industry in the last 10 years has reduced 27%. Energy industry has reduced 17 percent. Private household, household has reduced 14 percent. But the traffic area has increased by 29 percent. So therefore, my strong recommendation is that if we are focusing on new infrastructure projects, we should not work against each other, for example, trains against airlines and airlines against trucks and so on. No, we have to interconnect the different uh, transport systems. This is a must. We cannot afford to have only a train system or only a, 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 a truck system. No, we have to make it happen that the equipment fits together. One example. And I can explain many, many examples. And here, frankly speaking, I'm missing the execution mode. We are talking nice, but frankly speaking, if I see what's really happened, I'm a little bit disappointed. Very short. May I, <laughs> I, I fully agree, but it's also us. I don't know. Mike it works. works. Yeah. Now it works. That was the reason I <laughs> it's was also us. Change of behaviors are not easy. So when it, when it comes to cars, it's still a status symbol. We like nice, heavy, big cars. We know there's a small, smart car with two or three liters of consumption is here, it's possible, but we don't like it. So I think the next generation probably <laughs> will think different because yes, they will change their mind. Per perhaps for us it's too late, but I think this potential is a must. I fully agree and every uh, 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 section has a comparative advantage, maybe the road, the railway or the uh, air uh, uh, transportation. And what Mr. Baker said, railways, I think, the comparative advantage up to five, perhaps also six hours of travel is you can work during uh, uh, this period so from an economic term. That's green, that's uh, effective. And therefore, I think the OECD is right. But uh, uh, to realize that, that's really difficult. It's change your mind, change the mind of the, uh, also for, of the industry, and then we can do that. Mr. Kaza, I'd love to get your input on that as well, and particularly on this question of coordinating the economic goals with the environmental and climate goals. You, for instance, uh, have been singing the praises of high-speed rail, understandably, but is that more of an economic case than an environmental one, for example? Uh, I believe that uh, there was a discussion on uh, how to uh, this, uh, uh, introduce uh, the uh, private sector fund. But uh, in my view, uh, it was a tradition that the uh, public sector fund was utilized. But recently, uh, we are seeing the uh, exhaustion of a uh, public sector. So uh, we are groping for the way to use a uh, public uh, private sector fund. But the uh, characteristics of an infrastructure uh, requires uh, the uh, a great amount of investment, and it would be uh, recovered in the long run. In other words, enormous uh, scale of investment plus uh, time duration. And uh, when we look at the uh, uh, 
uh, the users of infrastructure, the benefit of using infrastructure is one thing. But on the other hand, uh, it's not a direct use, but there's a benefit for the community uh, itself. So internal benefit and external benefit. There are two types of benefits. So in that sense, Uh, how to coordinate these benefits is a very uh, difficult uh, this question. I have uh, worked uh, for uh, National uh, Railway for 24 years, and uh, it did not work because uh, uh, decisions uh, were made on a governmental level. So uh, unless there is a uh, budget uh, compilation on the national government level, uh, nothing can be done, or wage, or the... Uh, uh, a fair system uh, have to be determined through uh, a parliamentary uh, deliberation. But uh, if uh, it is operated on a private sector basis, uh, then a plan for infrastructure or wage level uh, can be determined strategically uh, by management level. That is the characteristic. So on one hand is a consensus uh, way of doing. On the other hand is a, a strategic leadership. Uh, in other words, the uh, vision for the future would be needed uh, in the private sector. So the pri decision making uh, would be different. So uh, when we try to combine uh, these two totally different ways, uh, the best uh, recipe is not available. Uh, uh, from my viewpoint, uh, uh, TPT did not actually uh, function very well, so uh, wisdom would be needed. So uh, Japanese National Railway was privatized, so uh, we are operating as a, a private company, but although it is a, a private company, uh, we uh, cannot continue or sustain our business only thinking about tomorrow. We have to think about 10 years later, we have to think about 20 years later. And if we rely on uh, government money, national government uh, government uh, money, then uh, that will be reverting back to the past uh, as a national company. Uh, we are trying to build the uh, there's a, a 500 kilometer new railway, and this is going to be a total of uh, 5 trillion yen investment. And uh, this is an enormous uh, project, but on the proposition of not using any government money. If there's any better way, of course, we would coordinate uh, our way of doing with uh, that of government, but the criteria of decision making on the government side is totally different uh, from that of uh, private sector. So how to coordinate these two is extremely difficult. I'm telling you this uh, out of my own experience. So if public and the private can coordinate together, and overcome uh, the uh, totally different nature in terms of decision making, then uh, I would like to know the answer of this. We would all like to know the answer. And um, in fact, my whole next batch of cards was going to be about seamlessness and vertical integration as opposed to privatization. But I'm going to throw those cards away because we're getting very close to the end of our session. However, I'm going to take one brief comment from Under Secretary Baker and one very brief comment from Minister Vodka and then come to the Secretary General for a final summing up. So go ahead, please. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on one important question you raised uh, about the trade-off, as you put it, between the economy and the environment. Uh, we cannot trade them off. We have to have investment which achieve both together, which achieves economic growth and environmental protection and carbon reduction. There is no point in helping our economy in the very short term if we damage our environment in the long term. So the investments we make, whether it's in electric vehicles or railways or cycling, has to be with an eye to the environmental impact later on. I shall be travelling back um, to London tomorrow, thanks to Dr Gruber and his excellent railway service by rail from Leipzig to London. And uh, I should be, uh, when I get back there, a cycling minister as well, I should be looking to increase our investment in cycling because uh, the evidence from Germany and everywhere else is the cities which have got civilised town centres where people don't have to have cars everywhere, where they cycle and they walk are not simply cleaner, but actually have got better and stronger economies than those which are clogged up with cars. That train ride should give you plenty of time to digest all the results of this for Minister Vodka. Thanks very much. I, I think on this issue, it's, it's an area where Ireland is doing quite well in the sense that we're meeting all our CO2 emissions targets and Kyoto targets, although that will become harder later on, because, particularly because of agriculture um, and, and the amount of emissions produced from agriculture. I think when we talk about investment and transport, we shouldn't as well forget about the bus. 
Uh, you know, the bus is a very efficient means of transport. You have 30, 50, 60 people on the bus. Um, and the, the, the amount of emissions relative to cars is very low. And of course, the capital cost is very low because the roads are already there. Uh, and the bus can be purchased much less expensively than the high-speed rail, for example. Uh, on electric vehicles, um, it's, it, it's an area where we're trying to uh, start a lead. It's, uh, electric vehicles in Ireland are tax-free. Uh, at the moment, the electricity is free as well, uh, so it's a very attractive proposition. Um, but the numbers signing up are pretty small, really because people are concerned about the range of the cars. Although I think we'll get there. I think technology will improve in time, and electric vehicles really will take off. Uh, one thing, though, I think the industry probably should consider, though, is the marketing of electric cars, um, which all seems to be marketed towards the environmentalist. And, you know, somebody who likes my car, uh, I don't really want to drive a Leaf, and I don't really want to drive an IMEV either. It sounds like something you listen to when you want to listen to music. And I think they've marketed it all wrong. You know, you should be driving a Spark or a Volt or a Lightning or something like that. And I think if you want to get mainstream people to buy electric vehicles, the marketing will have to change the cost will have to come down and the range issue will have to be addressed. Take note, panelists, for the Smart Grid session. We will pick up on that point <laughs> later on. Minister, you might want to join us. <laughs> so now the hard job. Secretary General, would you please uh, do us the honor of summing up what you heard here? What has possibly provoked interest on your part, disagreement, acclamation, ac uh, uh, affirmation? Well, uh, <clears throat> First of all, congratulations to all the panelists because they, um, they really uh, focused and targeted uh, very impressive uh, what's going on uh, in uh, the case of China, uh, the, um, the transport sector there. Very ambitious, uh, very crucial. And then, of course, as uh, Mr. Fang said, uh, uh, we, we depend on a very ambitious uh, investment project here and uh, therefore we have to go for it. Um, it's, uh, we, but we also have to go for sustainable, safe, and secure. That that is obviously the the other part. Um, Doris um, uh, basically uh, said uh, it, this is very impressive. To stay number one in competitiveness, which they come out systematically on top of competitiveness, you got to stay number one in terms of the infrastructure. Uh, and, and that is very, uh, very critical. This is a country that is a small open economy keeping number one by precisely updating its infrastructure all the time. That's a, a very big lesson. Um, and then the multi-year planning concept, which Doris referred to. But I suppose the best line I would quote from Doris here is, we like our cars, you know, we like our cars. So that means we got to work on the cars themselves and make them better and more more effective, um, but uh, the, uh, the, the road to rail that you passed on to Mr. Grube and um, uh, most uh, decisive success factor of today on, on mobility in general, uh, a very important, uh, very critical. I just came from uh, Berlin to Leipzig here, I have to say, it was a, that was a pretty seamless uh, trip and uh, uh, the, 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 whole, the whole process was you, you felt like it was very critical to the success of what's going on in, uh, in Germany today. Um, the, um, Mr. Kasai's uh, uh, example about the Tokaido uh, Shinkansen, and uh, well, you move, you know, from anywhere that you move from six hours to one hour, my God, you know, you, it's, gotta, it's gotta be dramatic. And if you are increasing the, uh, the uh, productivity and the effectiveness of the um, of the uh, uh, economy uh, like that, uh, that speaks well uh, about the future of the Japanese uh, productivity and economy, which has been under pressure lately. Uh, again, it goes back to the question of infrastructure being a pretty uh, crucial element of uh, competitiveness and productivity. Mr. Uh, Mr. Varadkar uh, said that uh, even under the constraints, uh, he said, uh, but remember, if you build it, they may not come. Uh, this is quite critical because uh, in, in the infrastructure, the amounts are so large, they're getting larger and larger per unit of investment. And therefore, the question, again, the multi-year planning element, the don't stop it if you're going to have a, a, a budget uh, constraint. The budget constraint has to be there. And I have to say, Doris, not everybody 
can afford to have a, a fund which where all the money is already deposited and we are not going to interrupt the flow over the period of time. And not everybody can afford to go public. Effectively, the conventional wisdom today is precisely the opposite, that you can't go public, and because you can't go public, you should go public-private. But if you, can't go, if you can go public because you can afford it, well, what can I tell you? <laughs> Do. <laughs> But uh, uh, when it goes to the private, to, to, to the developing countries, which is another prob uh, point you made, I think maybe the opposite is true, and that is uh, these have very uh, uh, vulnerable and very shaky public finances, and therefore the problem uh, is that if you only go public, you'll never do it. And as uh, uh, Trevor Emanuel said in Accra, he said, how do you spell aid? He said, T-A-X. So that means you start by mobilizing domestic resources first, uh, 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 but, you know, um, local helps. Uh, I have to say, uh, with Mr. Kurland, uh, the, he said, how do you promote and then, and how do you pay? <laughs> she asked. Uh, and these programs like the Tiger program and the, um, the uh, infrastructure, the leveraging the local projects to go national, this is the equivalent also to what the Europeans are doing with the EIB. Uh, again, it is because countries themselves do not have the wherewithal and uh, by, by leveraging through the EIB, for example, they can go over a long period of, of longer period of time. But again, these are public monies. The EIB is, is uh, now, whether uh, you go through the EBRD or some ro regional development bank to go, it, you can go private also. The question, the mix there is important. Uh, I would not want to, to uh, condemn some of these projects not to get done simply because um, uh, of the insufficiency in one particular year. And if you wait for uh, a very shiny day, a very sunny day budgetarily, then you're going to wait forever. Uh, this is the other question, the trade-offs in terms of when you get the benefit and when you can afford it. Now, some countries can't afford it. I, I have to say... I was, uh, you know, doing the sign of the cross when Minister Varkar said, and maybe there will be other countries that will accompany, you know, Ireland and Portugal and Greece. And I hope there aren't. I hope you're wrong. I hope you're absolutely stay there, uh, uh, that you're a small group and that the issues start solving themselves out. But, of course, this is another uh, problem, and that is that today the awareness about uh, the incapacity of public finances to start new projects long term. But what is the UK doing? He says they have the toughest, one of the toughest adjustment programs in the world, regardless of whether it's in Europe or not in Europe or whatever. And it's a credible program. And they're really, you know, they've been rolling it out on time. But he's saying we're doing rail, we're doing the roads, we're doing the bicycle paths, we're doing... We're doing all the infrastructure on transport that is necessary regardless. Now, this is another way to do it. A very tight budget, a very tough budget, but at the same time saying there are certain priorities we will not put to the side, even in, in, in tight budgets, and we'll, we'll keep them there. Uh, it, he also said the trade-offs have to be taken into account. Decisions have to be taken. And he said something like the fact that that also produces healthier ministers, right? Because they get on the bicycles, <laughs> which is good. That's, a, that's another, that's another a good thing. Uh, last uh, but not least, uh, uh, let me say that uh, uh, I think the, the, the feel, the, the, the taste that uh, one gets after listening to the, um, to the panel uh, about uh, seamless uh, transport and about the experiences is that uh, first of all, it is possible. It is possible even in a time of tight budgets. Second, that the private sector uh, participation is absolutely critical. But that for the private sector participation to happen, rules have to be clear. The prices have to be right. The policies have to be predictable. They have, have to have long-staying power. Contracts have to be absolutely ironclad and then when you have all that, when you have a price and when you have a contract and when you have rules and you have a policy, a framework policy, then you can take it to the market, not before. So you don't start the other way around. We here, we're talking about literally trillions 
in needs for investment over the next uh, few decades. And uh, that's not going to happen if we don't package it in this way. You start with a policy, you start with the ingredients that are necessary, then you take it to market. We've done uh, exactly the opposite uh, uh, too many times. So uh, altogether, um, I'd say we're very encouraged. Many times you alluded to the OECD. We're certainly going to be doing our homework. We take our, our, uh, our instructions from all of you. We're going to be working with the ITF, and uh, we're going to be there um, next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. So some clear words of advice and warning to take away with us from this truly very, very interesting panel. I'd like to thank all of our participants for very thought-provoking contributions and also uh, for a lot of foresight and vision for us as we go forward. So a warm hand, please, for all of the panelists. May I now ask you to, to end for Lord MacDonald as well. Uh, extra round for him. Lots of, lots of competition for those Macquarie funds. Uh, thought I heard China saying it's in the game as well there. <laughs>